Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. I'm glad a lot of you have joined in right on time. A lot of you in fact join in before 10 a.m. as well. It is always advisable to watch these videos, these classes live so that you can also get a chance to ask your questions to clarify your doubts as well. I hope by now all of you have already subscribed to our YouTube channel. If not, you can just hit the subscribe button right away. And please don't forget to attend the live quiz that we have right after the session ends on our Telegram channel. If you have still not been added on our Telegram channel, please use the link given in the description of the video to become a part of that channel as well. So let's begin without waiting any further. Let's see what are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper that we have here for you today. The first article that we will be talking about today is about how safe are the workplaces in India for women. Now, this is a topic on which you keep on getting a lot of important articles. That is, are the workplaces in India, be it the private sector workplaces or even the public sector workplaces, are these safe enough for women to be there? The context in which this article has been written is, you would have seen how a few weeks back, there were a lot of women professional wrestlers in India who were protesting at Janta Mantar in Delhi against the chief of the Federation of Wrestling saying that the Federation chief of wrestling had actually sexually harassed a lot of female wrestlers. A lot of these wrestlers were those who have already won international medals for India. They were protesting in large, large numbers and they did get support from large section of the society as well. Now, this is a very exceptional thing. Exception in the sense that because these are professional athletes, because these are names that people across India know, we watch them on TV, we cheer for them when they represent India. That is why they were able to ensure that they could get all that media attention, that all the people could actually come and support them. However, the problem here is that if the same thing happens with any common individual, any common female going to an office, if the female has been harassed by her boss, there is a very, very, very little chance that any action will be taken against the boss. That is a big problem. And this is precisely why, as per the author, we do not have a lot of women at our workplaces. Yes, whenever we talk about why do we have lesser women, we mainly talk about the fact we have a patriarchal society. We say that maybe men in the family are not allowing the women to go out and work. That may be one of the reasons. But one other very, very big reason is that our workplaces are still not secure enough. Just imagine that. Just imagine for a moment. Talk about any individual, any common women. Let's say that woman has a problem in the workplace. Her boss made some sexual advances against her or her boss asked for some favor. In that case, just imagine and just tell me, what would be the reaction of the women and how would it be taken? In a lot of cases, the women will not even argue, women will not even complain. Why? Because a lot of women coming from middle class, lower middle class for whom the job is very, very important. They might say, no, it is very important for me to continue with the job. The common perception that we have is you can't complain against the boss, right? You just can't complain against the boss because you never know when your job will actually come in danger. Secondly, you all would have seen stories and heard people that it is on paper very easy to go to police station. But in reality, when you actually go to the police station, it is extremely, extremely difficult for the police to come and even register a complaint. So it's very difficult to get your complaint register, number one. And secondly, it is also extremely, extremely difficult to get the women to speak out against their bosses. Only those women who are highly educated, those who are highly independent, those who are confident enough that if not this job, I can get any other job. Only those women usually would go out and raise their voice. But that is a minority of women. Most of the women are not like this. That is why, yes, it is a good sign that the women wrestlers came out to argue for their rights and they have been given the support. Government has formed a committee to look into this. But on the other hand, we have to understand this is a minority for women because most women do not have that luxury. 
you all would have heard about the Vishakha guidelines. Remember, I'm sure all of you would have heard about Vishakha guidelines. The guidelines that have been given by the Supreme Court of India to prevent sexual harassment at workplace. The Vishakha guidelines of 1997, in fact, came up when an NGO called, there were multiple NGOs, the main NGO as a petition, the case was Vishakha. When an NGO filed a case on behalf of a Rajasthan woman called Bhavri Devi, she was sexually harassed at her workplace. This is when the Supreme Court came up with the guidelines. Guidelines such as what should be the provisions in place of work to prevent sexual harassment. What should be the first level of complaint? Where should the women go and file a complaint to which committee? The committee should be held by a women and who should the committee report to so on and so forth. The government of India also has passed a law and we'll discuss about that as well in just a bit. But the reality is <clears throat> Even after Supreme Court judgment, even after the government passing a law, we do not see a lot of things changing on the ground. Because the problem is in such a huge scale of population that we have in India, in such a huge poor population that we have in India, we are getting a job earning for your family takes preference over anything else. It is very, very difficult to ensure that these kind of laws are actually followed properly and implemented on the ground. The author here says, that if you look at our employment scenario, look at all the data from the government, look at the labor force survey that we have, in all those surveys you will see the participation of women in workforce in India is much lower as compared to males, as we discussed earlier. We cannot just keep on blaming a patriarchal mindset for that because safety at workplace also is a major, major reason for the same. There is also one more reason. Most of the offices, most of the offices where you work at, you will see how many women are there in the leadership position as compared to how many males do we have in the leadership position. It applies to almost all companies, all organizations, including the government itself. Look at the government of India. Without Googling, if I ask you, tell me names of at least four women ministers in the cabinet. Would you be able to tell me without Googling? Four women minister names in the cabinet. Just think about it. Without Googling, it would not be very easy for you to actually tell. And on the other hand, if I tell you, if I ask you, tell me the name of four male members in the cabinet, you might be able to. So there is actually a difference between that. The difference being that yes, Smriti Rani, Nirmala Sitaraman, these kind of names actually come to your mind at the very top. But when it actually comes to naming other ministers, you might not have a very easy time. Again, if you can, great. Not a competition, but if you actually realize it is not that easy. Similar is the situation in the private sector as well. If you see the number of women in the leadership positions, you will actually see it's not a lot of representation given to the women. On the other hand, you will see that males are dominating all these positions. Now, what difference does it make? Many people would say, no, 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 it doesn't make a difference. It is all good. But the difference mainly is that in this case, you have to understand that the lesser women that we have in the leadership positions, lesser will be the chances that people will go or women will go and raise their complaints. Because when they don't see support at the very top level, it does not give a very positive signal to anyone who wants to go ahead and file a complaint. And that is where the issue is. The author here suggests what can we introduce or what are the changes that we can introduce to make the situation better. The first phrase that the author gives is start early and start at home. See, it's a reality that what we see at home during our childhood at the formative years of our lives that actually brings a lot of changes to our mindset. A lot of people who do not see that in their household, their mom, their sisters or female in the family are not given an equal status. They will also assume that this is what normalcy is. The problem here is that whatever you let the child see at the home, that same child will now grow up thinking that that is normal. And that is where the problem starts. 
you have to ensure that in the houses themselves you have to ensure that the families are treating their women in the right manner because that is what will then form the brain of that particular child and that message will pass on from generation to generation so start at home second there is a theory that the author here gives nature versus nurture now what do you mean by that see many people when you talk to people and say you don't speak in a good language or you speak in a very harsh language their excuse is oh this is my nature have you noticed this there are some people who you don't like the, the way that they speak you tell them you speak very harshly you don't speak well you are always always abusing someone and their reaction is oh it is my nature it is my nature but that is not how it works nature is as important as nurture meaning that how were you nurtured that is even more important it is not in your genes that you will abuse everyone it is not in your genes that you will talk trash about everyone it is the way that you are nurtured so while nature is one nurture is also an extremely important role to play this is where the society the parents the teachers the first teacher that you have in school they also play a major major role in shaping your mind all of that the nurturing given to you at the very childhood level can actually make a big impact in how the entire country runs because that is all connected third you have to fix goals we have to commit that we will make our places safe for women to come out and work in large numbers because this is in the interest of everyone see i'll tell you a very simple thing let's assume that you are someone who doesn't care how many women are in the workplace okay let's just assume for a moment that you are a man you don't care how many women are in the workplace or not you only care that i am a tax paying citizen i am following all the laws i am a good citizen i don't break the law that is the only thing that you are concerned about let's assume that for a moment but my argument is even you should be concerned why i'll tell you why as more and more women enter the workplace what will happen there will be more people paying the taxes when there will be more people paying the taxes the government might think in the future that we are already getting a lot of money from income tax let's reduce the rate of income tax for everyone are you understanding so it is a connection with you also even if you are not concerned how many women are in the workplace rather than matter to me i am just earning my money i am just giving my salary that is it but my argument is it should concern you as well because in the long run a better economy in the long run when the government just assume government gets more taxes in the long run where will the government spend that money the government will spend that money in making more roads in making more airports more highways more bridges so it will impact you only positively so from today onwards even if you do not care let's pray that more women enter the workforce because it is for your betterment it is for my betterment it is for everyone's betterment because as the economy will grow we will see that more and more taxes will begin to the government the government might be able to spend that money in a better manner now as i told you apart from the vishakha guidelines given by the supreme court the parliament has also passed a law in this regard called the posh act p o s h this stands for sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act this is not a new act it has been over it has been almost a decade now if you actually see there are a lot of very important points in this act which are usually not followed which are usually not followed the first important point in this act if there is any company that has multiple branches in every branch that has 10 or more employees so that is a cut off any company or any branch having at least 10 employees or more than 10 employees they must have something called an icc icc is internal complaints committee <clears throat> in simple terms in every office having over 10 employees there should be a committee called internal complaints committee so if any women has a problem she has been sexually harassed she should be able to go to that committee without any problems that committee has to be held by a women so it has to be a women headed committee that is a compulsion in every single workplace having 10 or more women also this committee will report to 
the head in the district usually these are district magistrates the committees will report to them on the other hand district magistrate can even appoint some other district officer but usually it is a district magistrate that we have all these committees in the city will report to the district manager district uh, magistrate then the complaint committee will have the power similar to a civil court they can examine a person they can ask for evidence etc also whatever complaints have to be given or whatever complaints are given to this committee they will either pass on the complaint to the police or they can start the inquiry themselves within 90 days so either they complete the inquiry within 90 days or they if they are not able to do that if they don't know how to inquire they don't have any evidence then they have to pass on this committee's complaint to the police and police will then look into it now the victim can be women of any age whether employed or not that is also important for example let's say there is a company there is an office there are women employees who are safe no problem with that there is a customer who comes in for some work in the office and that customer is then harassed so that customer can also file the complaint it's not just the employees who will be covered it's not just the employees so any women visiting the workplace any contractual laborer who is not a full-time employee those can also register a complaint the complaint procedure as, as i told you it is not compulsory that the complaint has to be filed to the committee to act if the committee thinks that the women is not being able to file a complaint maybe she is fearful and the committee thinks something wrong has happened the committee can start the investigation by themselves as I told you, 90 days, 3 months is the time period given to them. And interestingly, there is also a possibility of conciliation. What do you mean by conciliation? Conciliation means without giving punishment to someone. Let's say X is the victim. She has filed a complaint and Y is the accused. So committee can also allow X and Y to talk in private, to talk outside the committee and have conciliation maybe y says sorry to x y says i'll compensate in some way whatever but yes co conciliation is allowed however no monetary settlement shall be made as a basis of conciliation so you can't exchange money in return y who is the accused cannot say okay i'll give you some money take back the complaint no if the y says sorry and x says okay no issues don't do it again X can take back the complaint that is fine but no money can change hands when it comes to conciliation under this particular issue this is what the author here is saying just a recap very quickly we have to ensure that women's participation in the workplace improves how do we do that by making the workplaces much more secure how do we do that by changing our attitude getting it a part of our education getting it into the family system the family values have to ensure that all these things fall in place only then when we have more women participating or when we have more women hoping that the workforce or the workplace is safer then more women will participate automatically that is what the article is let me see if there are a few comments <coughs> uh, praveen is saying internal committee is for offices with less than Ten, with more than 10 employees what are the protection measures for offices less than that so Praveen as per the government there is no compulsory provision for those companies having less than 10 employees but yes if a company itself wants to go ahead and make a committee they can very well do that but the government does not does not compel them for those companies who have less than 10 employees then I have uh, Shubhankar is saying make a separate video on pause. Shubhankar if you uh, go to our YouTube channel playlist in the explained series I have done a pause session of 45-50 minutes in the explained series so you can watch that we have already done that class already. Okay I'll take uh, a few more questions. Then I have a question what is nurture? Nurture means basically uh, how do you bring up a child the values that you give to the child. Uh, the lessons that you give to the child, moral education, basically that is what is called nurture. Okay, a lot of questions about Vishakha guidelines. So Vishakha guidelines was a case in 1997. There was a case of uh, 
there was a lady in Rajasthan, Bhavri Devi. She uh, was raped by multiple people at her workplace when she was trying to stop a child marriage from happening. <coughs> so what happened was that because she was a poor old lady, she could not go to the court. A lot of NGOs came to help her. One of the NGOs that held her was called Vishakha NGO. So Vishakha was the name of the NGO. So a lot of NGOs filed a case on her behalf. This case went to Supreme Court in which Supreme Court gave something called the Vishakha guidelines. Vishakha guidelines basically are similar to this law only. Vishakha guidelines are guidelines by the Supreme Court of how at the offices we should stop sexual harassment, what should be the procedure of filing a complaint, what should the complainant do, etc. Et so that is what the Vishakha guidelines are given by the Supreme Court in order to stop sexual harassment at the workplace. Perfect. Let's go ahead then to the second important news article. The second important article is about the data protection bill. Now the data protection bill interestingly has had a long history. Now what exactly is that history? See the government of India introduced the data protection bill in the parliament multiple times. But government of India has not really been happy with the overall concept and the overall structure of the bill. So they keep on taking it back. Even the present bill, the present data protection bill has not been passed completely. Now, a few things was what is data protection bill and what does it want to do? Let's try and understand. Let's say you make an account on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. You post a lot of photos there, you update your status, you give it a lot of information flying from here to there. Today I am here eating at this restaurant, etc. Now the question is simple. If you let's say upload a photo on Facebook and if you upload a state or something is Facebook then allowed to sell your data to someone can Facebook then sell this photo of yours to someone or can Facebook actually tell some company that every Monday he goes to this restaurant can Facebook because every Monday that you go you will have to do a check in because people believe without checking in it is not counted so the question is, is it possible or is it allowed for Facebook to sell your data? Is it allowed for Instagram to sell your data or not? Now the problem here is there was not much clarity on that. So there were a lot of allegations because how does Facebook make all that money? Facebook account is free for you, free for us. So how does Facebook make money? Facebook makes money through the ads, but to make the ads even better, to make the ads even better, Facebook has to use the data. I'll give you a very simple example. Okay, let's take this example. Let's assume that every second, third day, you put a photo of eating something. Let's just take this example. Every second, third day, you put a photo, you are eating, you're going to a restaurant and it is a restaurant that let's assume sells biryani. Just a random example. Let's say every second, third day, you are eating biryani, putting a photo. Every second, third day, you're in a restaurant, putting a photo. Now, if there is a new restaurant in your city who is selling biryani, that restaurant wants to show ads to the people, who would they want the ad to be shown to? Would they want a vegetarian to see their ad or would they want a person to see their ad who actually eats biryani? Who would they want as their customer? Right? Their ads would be the most, the most pointed or their ads would be the most useful if they see or if they show their ads to those who eat biryani regularly, right? But the company doesn't have that data. Who has that data? Facebook has that data. Facebook will tell the company, don't worry. We take the responsibility. We will only show your ads to those people who eat biryani every second, third day, who go to restaurants that serve biryani. So we know who are these 10,000 people in the city who have biryani every single day. So we will show your ads only to them. And that is why these companies pay a lot of money to Facebook. Are you understanding it? That is how it all works. Facebook doesn't take money from you. Facebook doesn't take money from me. They take money from those companies by promising them. We will show your ads to those people who have the best chance of buying your product. Meaning that in simple terms, you and me, our data is being sold. Now to stop that from happening, almost every government around the world has introduced their own version of data protection bill. India also is now introducing the data protection bill. The data protection bill that we introduced earlier 
that was removed government was not happy with that now we have a new version of the data protection bill that is being discussed the author here is saying that i am not happy with the data protection bill the author says that there are four important points there are four important points because of which data protection bill is still not perfect first important point the data protection bill dilutes the rti act now what do we mean by that see <clears throat> The RTI Act, as you know, is extremely important because it empowers people. It empowers you, me to actually go ahead and know a lot of things about the government. What the author says here is, author has given a very interesting example. You all might have heard about PDS. PDS is Public Distribution System. So PDS basically are those government... Uh, shops ration shops where if you are poor you show your ration card and they will give you ration at a very subsidized price now what happens and you can ask your parents your grandparents what what used to happen earlier was whenever people used to go to these pds shops that i want to buy wheat or rice they would say oh the ration is over the stock is over i can't really give anything to you why because no one will come into your shop and see if the ration is left or not so every single day what will happen is whenever you have to go to the shop you will see that at the shop the shopkeeper will say everything is over but now what has happened is with the RTI with the RTI now these PDS shop owners will now compulsorily have to tell what exactly or how much ration do they have they compulsorily will have to publish how much ration is left so that they can't fool the public they can't tell the public, oh, no, 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 ration is over, I can't give you the money. That is how the RTI Act is good. Now, what has happened with the data protection bill is, data protection bill has one important clause. That important clause is that now, if you ask for information from any public authority, they can say no completely that, no, this is a private data, we cannot show it to you. So if you apply the same example here, let's say you go to a PDS shop, in the PDS shop you want to go and you want to buy something, the PDS shop owner says that the ration is over. You can't force a PDS shop owner under the RTI to tell how much ration is left now. So you are diluting the RTI Act, that is first big problem. As I told you under the RTI Act earlier, you could force these ration shops, these government ration shops to tell how much stock is left, but now that will not happen. Second problem as per the authors is <clears throat> the government is allowed to make rules on how the data will be protected. The government has been given a lot of powers to decide how the data will be protected which companies will be allowed to store data, which companies will not be allowed to store data, every single thing about this law. The government has the power to decide. Meaning that it has given a lot of executive powers to the government. A lot of discretionary executive powers have been given to the government. Third big problem. Government itself has a lot of our data. See, when you go and make your Aadhaar card. You give so much data to the government right now. You give all your biometric data, you even give your fingerprints, you give your uh, eye scan, every single thing that we have, all our data is with the government. Now the problem is, although the bill applies to government entities as well, that is fine. But the problem is, as per the law, there will be a body that will be formed called the Data Protection Board. The Data Protection Board will be responsible for ensuring that our data is not misused. But this is a government body. Government will appoint people in the data protection board. So how will they make sure that the government does not misuse the data? Because the problem is the government also has a lot of our data, not just Facebook. Government can also misuse data for various purposes. At the end of the day, we have to understand Government also is done by political parties. Governments also can use or misuse data in whatever way that they want. That is a problem here. The Data Protection Board, a body that will look into the working of this law, is not independent, rather it is appointed by the government. That also is a big, big, big loophole. And then the fourth problem. The bill says that Data Protection Board will be digital by design, meaning that 
let's first understand what is what will data protection board do if i come to know that for some reason or in any case whatsoever facebook has sold my data then what i can do is i can go and complain to the data protection board and they will take action against facebook but the problem is they will only take complaints online they will only take online complaints and the problem is yes a lot of people in india now have mobile phones but you have to understand if you see how many people still use mobile phones if you see how many people are capable of filing a complaint through mobile phones you will see they are still a very very small minority only 33 percent women in india have ever used the internet in such a situation you are creating a big digital divide I'll give you a very similar example. If you remember when the COVID-19 vaccine rollout started, we all had to download the COVID app. We had to book an appointment slot and then we got the vaccine. Remember? So in the beginning, the government made it mandatory that you have to make an appointment online and then vaccine will be given to you. Then the government realized this later on that this is a big mistake because not everyone in India owns a mobile phone. Even if you own a mobile phone, it is not necessary that you own a smartphone. Because on non-smartphones, the app will not be downloaded. And third, even if you do use a smartphone, it is not necessary you know how to use the app. So all of that combined, the government later on, after many months decided, okay, you can now just walk in and make sure that you can get a vaccine without even getting an appointment made. Similar is the problem here. With the data protection board, you are saying that you will only allow complaints to be made online. What about those who can't make a complaint online? What about those who are not willing to do that? That is a big problem that has not been solved. That is why as per the authors, there is still a need for the data protection bill to be looked into once again. <coughs> as I told you earlier, the data protection bill is still being discussed. The government has reiterated it time and time again that we are trying to make the best version of it. Most of the developed nations have already made the data protection bill of their kind. EU has a very strong data protection bill. Australia, USA, all these countries have very strong data protection bills. In India, we are still in the process. Also, one more thing very quickly. This data protection bill mainly talks about seven big principles. It talks about seven important points. First important point is use of personal data by organization must be in a lawful manner. And any data, any of your data which is to be sold to anyone, first permission has to be taken from you. If the customer, the consumer allows that I am okay for my data to be shared, only then the data should be shared. Point number one. Second point, personal data should only be used for purposes for which it was collected. If your photo was uploaded on Facebook just to be a display pic, it doesn't have to be or should not be sold to anyone for other purposes. It should only be used for purposes where it is intended. Then data minimization means only collect as much data as required, not more than that. You would see in a lot of websites, you are required to have your phone number, Aadhaar card, email ID, every single thing, address, etc. Even when they don't need it. So, you only should get or deposit or ask for that data which is required. Emphasis on data accuracy should be made. Personal data should not be stored perpetually by default. Means once you give data to Facebook, it should not be stored for a lifetime. There should be a time limit. There should be safeguards to ensure no data is misused. Person who decides the purpose and the means of data should be accountable for this processing. All these are principles of the data protection bill. Eventually this will be passed, but in what form is it passed? It remains to be seen and it will be passed in just a coming few weeks. The next article that we have here is about a topic that has been going on for a few weeks now. The topic of minimum age of marriage for girls specifically. Now there are two reasons why this topic has been in the news in the past year or so. One reason you might have realized the parliament of India tried to pass a law. They introduced a bill to raise the minimum age of women in India from 18 to 21. Remember a few months back, there was this bill introduced in the parliament to increase the minimum age of marriage for women from 18 to 21. So just to give you a context for males, minimum age of marriage in India is 21. 
for females it is 18 the government wanted to increase this to 21 they introduced a bill but the bill did not pass the bill is still not passed it is in the standing committee so there is a committee of the parliament that is looking into it first also i wanted to give you one more thing here a lot of people have a confusion and i see many people in the chat also many people have this confusion you all would have read that this female marriage bill was introduced many of you have assumed it has passed already no that is wrong the bill has not passed so all those who are writing in the chat female age is now 21 no that is not true the bill has not passed and i understand there's a lot of confusion because a lot of newspapers cover the news in such a way when you only read the headline you think oh the bill has already passed no the bill has only been introduced so i'll give you one more one very interesting uh, method of how to check that so basically what you have to do is if you just go on google search for something called prs <clears throat> just go to google search for prs now prs is an amazing website which keeps a track of all the bills, all the members of parliament, their attendance record, every single thing. You go to this website called PRS and you can type the name of the bill. Whatever random name or not the exact name, but even if you type the name of the bill, let's say you type a legal age of marriage bill, something like that. This will actually show you the name of the bill and it will show you exactly what is the stage where the bill is so it will tell you for example in which house it has passed in which house it has not passed where is the bill right now is it with the committee is it with the president of india where exactly is it right now so that is a very interesting and a very easy way authentic way to find out whether a bill has been passed or not so this bill has not been passed you can check the status on prs and you can do this with any bill it actually tells you how exactly should it be or how exactly has the bill been progressing over the few stages now the other reason why this was in the news is that there was a petition filed in the supreme court that because parliament is not doing it supreme court should increase the age of marriage to 21 so there was a petition filed that since the parliament is not doing it the supreme court should go ahead and increase the age of marriage for women also 21 supreme court rejected the idea supreme court said no we will not do this because it is the parliament's job the parliament will do this it is not our concern now <clears throat> the article here that you see talks about the fact that even though the minimum age of marriage for women in india is 18 even then child marriage is highly prevalent in india we see a lot of child marriages in india in different states altogether and that is a big big cause of concern so the point here is even though we have a law that below 18 years of age women can't get married even then women are getting married at a younger age so even if you increase the age to 21 what difference would it make are you understanding it if we already have 18 as a minimum age but even then we have so many women marrying or being forced to marry below 18 even if you increase the age to 21 it doesn't make a difference to them that is a big problem that we have here this is what the article is based upon 23 percent women in india aged between 20 and 24 were married before their 18th birthday so almost a quarter of women in india getting married are getting married below the legal age of marriage the problem here is in such cases you will not find a lot of cases being registered see understand this is a very simple thing to understand psychologically you will only go and register a complaint when it is against someone else there are very few people in the entire society who will go and register a complaint against their own family members will you go and register a complaint against your own parents that they forced me to marry most probably that will not happen because you think no my family is everything to me i cannot do that if your family has taken a decision even if you don't agree with it you go ahead with it that is a big issue that we have and that is why number of complaints registered against child marriage is very very few as compared to the larger number that we have this is a graph that shows you 
द ट्रेंड ऑफ वीमेन इन इंडिया गेटिंग मैरिड एट अ यंगर एज सी द शेयर ऑफ वीमेन हु आर गेटिंग मैरिड बिटवीन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर फोर्टी फाइव टू फोर्टी नाइन we discussed the other day also if you remember there is one very big factor that decides whether women will be marrying at a younger age or at an older age that is their education level a lot of research has been done already the research has shown more educated the women is more are the chances that women will not be getting married at a younger age more financially independent the women is better are the chances that the women would be able to get her point across and not be forced to marry at a younger age so education financial independence these are the two things that we have to focus upon if we have to tackle this problem of women getting married at a younger age there are arguments on both sides there are arguments in favor protecting the basic rights gender parity if male are getting married at 21 why female at 18 if the voting age is same for both if the drinking age is same for both then why is it that the age for getting married is different there has to be equality there has to be women empowerment as well then there are points in negative as well arguments against raising the minimum age it will only benefit those who are financially independent those women those girls who are not earning who are dependent on their family members they still will not be impacted by this we still have a lot of child marriages so just increasing the minimum age will not make a difference because anyways we still have so many of the child marriages there is no criminal record for early marriages as i told you most of these cases are not even registered because it's a family matter so many people don't like to bring out in the open and register such kind of cases the next article that we have here is about something that you might have heard about on television in news and maybe you know someone suffering from autism there is a very very bad and a widespread disease called ASD autism spectrum disorder it is a neurodevelopment disorder if you see people suffering from autism they do not have the required social skills they have difficulty in speaking they have difficulty in interacting with people they even have a difficulty in controlling their behavior all of these are problems associated with autism asd now what exactly is this article all about so in simple terms the article here is saying that as per a recent research so there is a recent research that has been going on right now if you see a recent research as per the research there is a direct connection between your gut health gut health means your digestive health and your autism problem although the authors here have mentioned this multiple times that this research is still not complete this research is still ongoing but in reality right now what we are seeing is there is a direct connection between autism and your gut health so children who are suffering from autism are much more likely to have constipation to have stomach infections so that their gut is not taking care of them those are the kind of germs that might have had a direct connection again they are saying time and time again this is not proven this is an ongoing research that is why they are open to all the question and that is why they are not asking anyone to go ahead and trust this or mention this anywhere in a scientific paper according to them fix your gut fix your brain will actually be the mantra going forward if you can fix your gut if you can fix your digestive health that will have a very very positive impact on even your autism behavior as per who 1 in 100 children are affected by autism in some way or the other these children have problem in their social interactions communication skills <coughs> verbal or non verbal etc till now not a lot of research was done about the connection between the brain and the gut because everyone thought that how can gut how can digestive system be connected to what is happening in your brain but now it has been proven that yes there is a connection between the two people suffering from autism are much likely to have constipation diarrhea flatulence bloating etc and that is what the authors here are pointing towards they are saying that the gut microbiome is believed to have a big impact on your immunity system 
and the metabolic activities of the human body as well. And if you fix the, he the health of your gut, it can reduce the burden of all these harmful microbes in your body and it will ensure that you will not go ahead and suffer from ASD in the long run. Yes, in the short run, you can take care of your digestive system. But again, as per the author, this is not proven research. So I'll just underline this time and time again. This is not proven research. As a precaution, you can take a lot of prebiotics, probiotics, ensure that you have a lot of fiber, ensure that you have a lot of curd and these kind of things in your diet. But there is some signal that is starting to prove that autism might be connected to this, the better your gut health is, but a lot more research has to be done in this regard. Now, rather than going into a lot detail of these research, because a lot still has to be proven, what I want to stress on is that there have been multiple initiatives taken on ASD at the national level and at the global level as well. For example, the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disability also talks about autism being one of the disabilities. So as per the United Nations, people suffering from autism should be considered in the category of disabled and thus they should also be given the advantages that all other disabled people get. Then under Government of India's Right of Person with Disability Act, the number of disabilities were in increased from 17 to 21 and again here autism has been added so if you talk about disabled people who have certain reservations certain benefits in the government jobs government programs in fact in that also autism has now been added in 2014 who adopted a resolution called comprehensive and coordinated efforts for management of autism spectrum disorders so there has been a lot of awareness raised about autism, how to deal with it because the problem is when you talk about people who are suffering from disability, we usually assume that physical disability is the only kind of disability. If you see someone physically hurt, if you see someone physically not being able to move properly or physically not being able to perform some of the life functions, the problem is that we consider only those people as disabled. But on the other hand, when it comes to people who are mentally unfit, when it comes to people who are psychologically impacted, we don't really assume that they are disabled. That is why the government has had changes in this law. People who are suffering from autism will also be considered as disabled in this case. The next article is pretty interesting, very important article about a very interesting discovery that certain scientists have made. Let's try and understand this. Scientists around the world have been trying to find out ways of how to stop global warming, right? Now, so far, we thought that to stop global warming, what can we do? We can stop pollution, we can stop climate change, maybe we do not burn so much coal, we do not burn so much fuel, etc. That is what we thought till now is the way forward. But now what is happening, scientists are now going towards a different way altogether. I'll give you an example. So the scientists are saying is that this is the earth. We have a lot of sunlight falling on the earth. So when the sunlight is falling on the earth, what if we create a barrier here? What if we create a barrier here, a shield somehow, so that not a lot of sunlight falls here? So lesser sunlight falling would mean lesser temperature on the earth and the global warming will reduce. Now, do you think this would work? This is what the scientists are now believing that rather than controlling how we actually harm the environment, rather than that, let us have a shield covering the earth so that the sunlight that is actually dropping that may not heat up the earth as much. That is what the scientists are thinking right now in America. Now, how is it that they came to this thinking? So what happened was basically they realized whenever there is a huge volcanic eruption, what happens in volcanic eruptions? You will see a lot of particles actually disperse in the atmosphere. So when all these particles disperse in the atmosphere, what happens is when sunlight is actually coming to the earth, 
those sunlight don't reach the earth's surface they are blocked by those particles only for some time so as i told you when there's volcanic eruption there is aerosol in the air in the atmosphere the sunlight does not stop here and when the sunlight does not stop here what happens is the average temperature of that particular area is not very high let's say there's volcanic eruption all these particles are dispersed in the air sunlight is falling on these particles it is getting reflected sunlight is not falling on the surface so the temperature of that particular area does not become very high that is the idea that the scientists thought that what if we also create such particles outside the earth so that sunlight does not fall those particles can be as per the author moon dust so the idea is and it might sound very crazy to you it might sound like a very superhero movie kind of an idea the idea is you go to the moon you collect a lot of dust and then you place all that dust somehow at a position where sun and the moon's gravitation field sorry where the earth and the sun's gravitation field cancel each other out let me repeat basically this is the earth this is the sun you place the moon dust somewhere here at a position where the sun and the earth's gravitation field cancel out each other so that it remains here only so that it is not attracted here or here as you would have realized that is called the lagrange point you might have heard about the lagrange point when you talk about isro's aditya mission remember isro's aditya mission that we have where isro is trying to ensure that we take up a study of the sun we are thinking of how and where can we place our observatory this is where you usually talk about those points where the gravitational pull of the earth and the sun can cancel out each other so this is the point where as per the scientists a lot of moon dust should be kept and that moon dust will stop the sun rays from falling on the earth in some numbers and as a result of that we will see that the temperature will not increase that is their crazy idea will it be implemented will it not be implemented only time will tell most probably it will not be implemented why because we don't know what the long term consequences it's easy to say that we will stop the sun rays from falling on the surface but agriculture is dependent on them on one hand you are saying that utilize the sun rays so that you can use make solar energy and get us towards the renewable form of energy on the other hand you are saying we are stopping the sun rays so going ahead and interfering with nature does not always augur well we don't know what impact would it have on agriculture patterns crop yields as well secondly see usually what happens when you see movies where aliens are attacking the earth you see all of us and all the countries working together usa becoming the leader of the world that we will protect the entire world but that is not what happens in real life in real life how will the countries all of them come together who will decide that we will take this up which role will be played by which country if something goes wrong then who will take the responsibility those are things that have still not been decided so these things have still not been decided how exactly is it that the countries can collaborate what changes will it bring in the entire world this is not a movie you can't just do something as an experiment and take it back so this is again an idea this infographic will show you how does it actually work but again it remains to be seen how exactly would this idea be implemented as you can see here reflective particles can be thrown into the stratosphere they will reflect the sunlight it will not fall down as a result of which we might have lesser amount of sun rays falling on the surface the temperature might not increase that much as a result of which we will see that at the end of the day the global warming might be curtailed that is what the governments or that is what the scientific idea is will it be a success idea or not it remains to be seen in the coming days these are the important articles that we had for you here today there are a couple of practice questions for you as always number 1 <clears throat> discuss the factors that impede labor force participation female labor force participation rate and suggest measures that can be taken to overcome this same second rather than increasing the minimum age of marriage for girls 
the problem of child marriage can be more effectively handled by focusing on their education and other social indicators do you agree elaborate both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each thank you so much for watching the video i'll see you tomorrow 10 a.m sharp don't be late thank you so much bye bye have a good day jai Hind.